Okay. Okay. So, um, my research, very briefly, is uh, looks at how sexualized violence practitioners, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, how they theoretically and practically engage with narrative therapy and critical theory within their mm -hmm. practice with folks who have experiences with sexualized violence. Mm -hmm. Indigenous girls and women <laughs> uh, who have experiences with uh, sexualized violence. And I also look at how white supremacy is interweaved within narrative therapy mm -hmm. and how it's um, how it shows itself and how it's also very hidden. And so I look at that area of practice as well. And uh, so um, my findings are in chapter four and this video will talk a little bit more about the so what, like what mm. does this mean for practice? Mm -hmm. And um, in my interviews with my participants, the, these themes actually came as part of the interviews. I've chosen to have them as a discussion um, just because they're so important. And the first one that came up is uh, this idea of having white practitioner reformation groups. Mm -hmm. And I have two quotes from two uh, different white practitioners. Um, and one of them who was speaking about a training they went to who had uh, indigenous resurgence coordinator. They said, one of the indigenous resurgence coordinators said, I would love to see your settler allies I would love to see a settler reformation group and really work on your shit together. Like we can't do this for you, but if you want to do it, I think it would be a really good idea. And the participants, and that's what I would love in professional mm. development. And another participant mm. said, professional development and support groups, that would be amazing. Like how do we, as social justice practitioners, how do we take good care of ourselves? How do we keep fighting the good fight, but not always feeling like our nervous systems are fighting? Mm -hmm. You know, how do we navigate systems like our work environments that are not always supporting us? How do we stay awake? How do we mm -hmm. not let our own privilege be invisibilized? Partly to feel like, oh yeah, I'm not in this alone. Like I think that's a huge piece of it. It's like, oh, there's others and you can see it. Oh yeah, he's doing that in that setting and they're doing that in private practice. And so those are two quotes that mm. stood out to me. Mm. And mm. just relaying that back to the calls uh, for justice in the uh, National Inquiry, where they specifically urge for changes to the relationships that colonial systems and structures are built on, which often requires questioning standard, the standard way of doing things, challenging the status quo, being open to radical new alternatives. And so I wanted to bring this up because white supremacy would rather us not have this conversation. And so I think it's really important. And so I'm curious mm -hmm. if there's anything that stood out to either of you in those quotes or if you have any other questions. You know what stands out for me when you say that is that I really come to this focus on individualism and how that is a white supremacist belief, I, I feel because mm. that we as practitioners are supposed to do it on our own individual and so is a client, right? Mm -hmm. So so are they supposed to heal themselves. They're not supposed to have this collective. And so when you say that, it's like, it makes, it's so important. Mm. And I think it is radical when you say, no, we need to do this as a group. We need to do this collectively and we need to do it also so that we're held accountable by others. Because mm. when you're in your own silo, you know, feeling like you're supposed to be a savior, which I think therapists really, mm -hmm. there's that belief, right? Mm -hmm. That you're supposed yeah. to do all the change and you're gonna change that person. I think it's awful mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not real. Mm -hmm. And I, it, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't do good. Mm -hmm. I think it does harm for mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I really appreciate you saying, just your, what come out of your research is that this collective, we, we, these groups mm -hmm. where they you know people not only be seen and heard but also be held accountable yeah with each other yeah yeah and I think <clears> too <throat> part of um, what I think is important is to with <clears throat> challenging white supremacy in these groups if these were to happen is to because um, white supremacy is very much cognitive and logic yeah. and a lot of critical theory 
kind of goes along with that mm. around being very heady. Yeah. And so we can analyze why we do things and how questions are informed by white supremacy or whatever it is we do mm. in these, and we would do in these groups. Um, but what's important is, is, would also be the doing the work, the critical somatic work that um, many, I think many people talk about, but Resume Manicum is one of them. Um, and so that's something that I think is um, definitely lacking. Like, again, we can have these groups in whatever way we, they, they, they turn out to be. Um, but if we're not bringing it back to heart, if we're not mm -hmm. bringing it back to our bodies, and if we're not doing that work, which looks different for all of us, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I think we're missing a huge piece. And mm -hmm. I, I think we would just be playing into white supremacy's playbook. Hmm. A question that comes up for me, and this is sort of the bigger question, I think, of, of a lot of your research, is how, how do you bring white folks in to mm -hmm. invest in this and mm -hmm. see this as a collective mm -hmm. form of action that they are responsible for? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you see yourself maybe encouraging that kind of work to happen in multiple contexts, mm -hmm. especially in the therapeutic context, because that's where you, mm -hmm. where you work, right? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I, th I see almost like, a, I see a split in practitioners. Mm. I, I work with practitioners who are white and who are f fairly critical and some very critical and, and some of them are participants in this research where there's like, again, they want these conversations and we'll talk about supervision a little bit later, but mm. one of the white participants talks about how, you know, she the type of supervision she wants isn't, was this a great question to ask my client mm. or is there counter transference or not? Mm. It's around, like again, how is white supremacy showing up in mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. this conversation? Mm -hmm. Where d was I blinded by my privilege, mm -hmm. or right? And mm -hmm. all of these types of questions that um, that come up. And I so I don't have an answer to your question, but I think it's a really good one. And I think those who are invested, I see already are invested and mm -hmm. would um, love to do some of this work. Mm -hmm. And then there are practitioners who. I talk to you and I, I don't know it's like it's not that I don't think it's not that they wouldn't want to it's it's I think too mm -hmm. heady mm -hmm. and that's where I think bringing it to like bring it down to the body the heart and soul of the work and bringing it back to the just the this calls for justice and calls to action because you know, most practitioners at least know know about them and hopefully have read them or mm -hmm. understand what the purpose is and what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. And um, so that might be a way in. I think it also depends on what my role is. If I'm a trainer mm -hmm. or if I'm a interviewing with someone or mm -hmm. if I'm just a colleague with someone, I might approach it differently. But right. but I don't know. Um, there might not be a buy-in. It might just no. feel like too much work. Yeah. And so they go on and do what they do hmm. well something that mm. comes up for me on that in terms of like as you said calling practitioners in mm. to an ethic of accountability and responsibility to the calls to action as a lived practice mm. not just mm. in the therapeutic moment mm -hmm. but for us as mm you know, living on these homelands, mm -hmm. like indigenous stolen homelands as yeah. an everyday practice. Mm. And so I'm just wondering what you, what you heard in your research and what mm. ideas you have for kind of opening up <laughs> that conversation for people to put their bodies and their hearts and their spirits at stake mm. in a more kind of real and sustained way. Yeah, just your thoughts on what what you heard would mm -hmm. rupture that mm -hmm. and what ideas you have for uh, training that ruptures yeah. that yeah i mean those are really big monsters yeah. that you just <laughs> mentioned <laughs> and and that's one of the issues also um as much as for example these reformation groups would be helpful um, and are needed there's also lots of opportunities for a group of white people, no matter how critically minded they are, yeah. to fall into traps, mm -hmm. right? With, and so 
Layla Saad, who's um, an author from Qatar, she wrote Me and White Supremacy. She does, at the back of her book, give um, white folks kind of a, if you're going to do this in a group, here's what you need to consider because, mm. you know, you can fall into these traps. Mm. Um, so that was brought up <clears throat> in, in some of my research. The steps have been written for us of mm -hmm. what to do and how to do it. Um, it's a matter of, it, like you're saying, the investment part, mm. and that's I'm troubled with that. I don't know where the investment might be. Mm. And in my mind, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, we can hold each other accountable. We've, mm. we've got roadmaps. Mm. We'll make sure to keep going back, mm. right? Like, I'm simplifying it mm. just as we're sitting here, and I don't, so I want to call, I want to just, like, make that transparent that mm. I'm falling into that rate as we're speaking. Okay. Okay. Uh, like, because I hear your concerns and, yeah. I, and I, I hold them deeply mm. uh, to my heart because I know that that's a struggle and I know that the, so much labor has mm. already been done mm -hmm. and it's not your job to guide me on how to disrupt white supremacy, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so... But, I, but I'm still here simplifying it and going, <laughs> oh, the group of people I'm thinking of, we could probably do this and, mm. and then I'll figure out how right. to do it with the next group. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. so I'm just wanting to be transparent. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I think it's good mm -hmm. to have faith and hope in humanity yeah. to do that work mm -hmm. and even in yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's what is important about even doing research like this. Mm. I think your hope and desire to find the willingness of communities uh, that are privileged to work with Indigenous communities, to work on the TRC, is, is incredibly important. Mm. And that's what's so key to your research, is that you asked that question. You mm. went out to find folks and say, what do you think? Mm -hmm. and, and held them accountable to that. And I think that's important. Like, but I guess often the the hard part for BIPOC communities is that, is that we've seen, <coughs> we've seen the trickery too often mm -hmm. yep. in the most mm -hmm. <laughs> um, benign, mm -hmm. often sugar-coated mm -hmm. beings, and that's that's the painful part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I I agree that without. Real, realistic interventions, right? Like mm. no training ever, no matter who leads it, will undo white supremacy. It's incredibly elastic, it's yeah. global, it's yeah. pernicious, it's yeah. multi-systemic, it is adaptive. And so, you know, I think the question is like, how do we keep doing this work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it's mm -hmm. imperfect and it reproduces itself, mm -hmm. even in the training and the interventions mm -hmm. we ourselves host with all we know about it, <laughs> you know, and it's happened to all of us where you're like, oh man, like yeah. my heart and spirit were in this, but yeah. here it was again. And mm -hmm. so I think even your ethic of saying like, I'm doing, I'm right now like wanting to simplify or like move forward is an ethic. Yeah, yeah like I was kind of asking you about ethic mm -hmm, and just mm -hmm. being honest about that mm -hmm. is already, I think, signaling a, an important ethic yep. yeah yeah um and i think seeing all the work we do as ripples in the water mm. like it's not gonna transform the whole lake but yeah. it'll be a ripple that unsettles this piece mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to me like doing this work um not to say that's all we can hope for but like that's that's what sustains us mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. yeah i don't know if you have other mm. kind of ideas around specific ways to interrupt or specific ways to call people forward and accountable, even if it's imperfect. Yeah. I think that's tricky too, because the, there's this call in versus call out, right? Yeah, so yeah. there's been a push, at least in some of the activism community, to now call in. We're not calling up, mm. out. we're not mm -hmm. calling people out mm -hmm. because that's hostile yeah. we're calling people in mm -hmm. so that they can actually learn and originally I loved the calling in mm. 
I think I heard it first from Vicki Reynolds. Um, and it made so much sense to me. I said, well, yeah, that's, let's do that. Let's start doing that. And then, but then that goes into the comfortable, like how can we do this as comfortable as right. possible, yeah, right. right? And so, you know, you can use whatever term you want, calling or calling out, but once it's, we're doing it to, for especially white people to be as comfortable as possible, um, yeah. I, then we're not, like we might be doing them a favor, but we're definitely not doing BIPOC communities a favor mm -hmm. by keeping mm -hmm. things comfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, there's a fine line there. It's like, if you're not making somebody, a white person comfortable, then they shut down or there's white tears, there's yeah. white fragility, but then you're also, if you do it gently, you're also catering to mm -hmm. that, so. Mm -hmm. White supremacy is a go go go, yeah. right? Yes. And if you're just if you're uncomfortable or if you do some harm, then we need to repair right away. Or, mm. you know, it's it's just fast paced. And what I'm trying to do is do the opposite. Mm. Is just kind of so. slow down. So, going into the second theme, um, is really about holding narrative therapy accountable mm. to intersectionality, anti-colonialism in particular, with, but also anti-racism. And in my work, that uh, didn't come up as much as I was hoping in the data. Mm -hmm. There were some questioning about it and there were some white practitioners who kind of named it, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a big part of my data. Okay. And so, which is why it's even more important that we talk about it for this mm -hmm. uh, video. And one of my participants said, you have to deconstruct narrative just like narrative therapy deconstructs people's problems. Mm -hmm. And I love that quote because um, I think a lot of people who either call themselves narrative therapists or draw on narrative, including myself, again, we, we I take it as for face value. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the theories mm -hmm. that's not deconstructed because it spends so much time deconstructing other things mm -hmm. like dominant discourses or um, whatever, whatever else it might be. And so uh, that was one of the white participants who said that. And then um, this is a really important uh, quote from a participant. And this was the Indigenous participant who said that, you know, they were talking about their concerns around Indigenous oral healing practices and how they're being described as narrative therapy by other non-Indigenous counsellors. Mm -hmm. And so they said, I think it's important to recognize the difference. I think they're similar in that they both use story to process trauma and they have phases that you go through in your processing. But in terms of traditional ceremonies for healing, when we go around circle and story, and the songs that we use and the people that are sitting there. There's so much meaning behind those different pieces that have been around for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of particularly non-Indigenous clinicians who are on, for example, the First Nations Health Benefits Counseling Payment Program, and they're like, we're narrative therapists, so we can serve Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it's an assumption that takes the similarities too far mm -hmm. to think that they would be interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate, you know, how you brought back the fact that storying and restorying has been a part of our way of life since time immemorial here. Mm -hmm. And so this desire to legitimize any framework mm -hmm. that draws on indigenous ontologies. Yeah and indigenous science and indigenous theories and then repackages it as you know a new mm. western finding about how to journey with people through their healing is yeah. extremely violent and yeah. as you say it's like a tool of colonialism you know you you hide you steal you appropriate <laughs> you repackage yeah. and then you invite the people you stole from to mm -hmm. um pay you as the expert to teach mm -hmm. them what they already know. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, it's it, it's really great that you can name that in your work. Um, and 
and there's a risk there mm -hmm. and I guess my question around that not to get into too much about like how you know indigenous storying has always been more than just storytelling it's a way of governance it's yeah. a way mm -hmm. of understanding your place in the world of building relationships and all the things we talk about in therapy mm -hmm. um, but outside of that I just wonder what you think would happen if narrative therapy training centered from the get-go in its materials and its tools and its training that history of appropriation hmm. and like how colonialism appropriates like if it was just yeah. at the center of the conversation from the start just transparent so we didn't have to do so much work mm. after yeah. like retraining yeah. and yeah. decolonizing and calling people in hmm. yeah. what like what what do you think would happen because i i think i mean i'm getting excited <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i get excited yeah. by a thought by that yeah. thought of making that transparent what do i think would happen you know narrative therapy is is very much this it, it's on a pedestal mm -hmm. in a lot of therapy communities and there are certain people in particular people who mm -hmm. have have developed narrative therapy mm -hmm. throughout the years in particular cis men white men mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. on a pedestal mm -hmm. for the work and contributions they've done i think depending on who is holding the training i don't i don't see that as a possibility i think there would be too much uh, male white fragility in the room to to have that possibility with that said there's also lots and lots of um, narrative practitioners who are not white and male mm -hmm. uh, who might be open to the idea mm -hmm. um, but i think the training would have so much more to offer if that's what it was like you could still do the training but if you mm -hmm. start off with mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. this, here's what, you know, here's where we appropriate and here's where we're in the wrong. Mm -hmm. And here's where we are, you know, here's what we're doing t in terms of repair, mm -hmm. if, if they are mm -hmm. doing some repair. Um, that's what I would love to see is, is more acknowledgement. And I, speaking of trainings, I did a training in February that got me really excited and it was uh, specifically narrative therapy training and it was called co-creating preferred stances on white supremacy and toxicity and the focus was on narrative racial healing and liberation hmm. while the training was really good and they talked about white supremacy they talked about how white supremacy comes in sessions and formulates how we ask questions and all of these really thought-provoking ideas on how white supremacy sneaks in. Mm -hmm. There was no mention still about narrative therapy's role and complicity in mm -hmm. white, upholding mm -hmm. white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so I was a little bit disappointed, not surprised, but I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. And when we were in small groups, I brought that up a few different times in a few different ways of, uh, in terms of curiosity mm -hmm. and the groups were mixed and I don't know what their everyone's ethnicity uh, or sorry not ethnicity ancestries were hmm. but it was kind of like oh yeah okay and then it was moved on mm. like there wasn't mm -hmm. I mean maybe that was my ideal hope is that people were going to catch on and go oh my gosh hmm. let's have this discussion this is like we need to talk mm. about this um, maybe because I'm so excited about talking about this and mm. unpacking it but it didn't happen and I was a little bit disappointed you know what that makes me think of is the very first point that you made about how it's almost like the reformation groups yeah. around thinking about white fragility it's it's almost like there needs to be a, an awakening yeah for narrative therapy and yeah. its fragility oh yeah, yeah. and like I, I don't, om I almost don't see them being separate. Um, almost the same yeah. journeys that need to happen, and they and they follow each other because they sit within the same foundations. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
we, I feel like I'm coming back to the same points that we talked mm -hmm. about in the first question. Yeah. Yep. How do we how do we shake that up? How do we call it out? Call it in? How do yeah. we start to you know yeah. shift the conversation? Yeah. yeah. You need to write calls for action. And with for all for the narrative team, therapy. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. you know what, Alina, with all the therapies. All therapies. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all, yeah. I know art therapy, mm -hmm. clinical counseling. They mm -hmm. all have these foundations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. The call to action, I think, is amazing. Yeah. It needs to happen, yeah. not yeah. just. And maybe that's another collective, yeah. right? Maybe mm. it's not just mm. in narrative therapy. Maybe those who want to go there, yeah. like yourself, yeah. can be with others who say, "Hey, yeah. enough already. Yeah. This is yeah. not working." Yeah. Well, and mm. I think there's more. Maybe it's just the circle as I'm in, mm -hmm. but there seems to be more conversation or more open to conversation around how other therapies like CBT or uh, some trauma-informed practice, I don't know, DBT, like what, call yeah. it whatever you want, yeah. that people I'm surrounded with are more likely and more open yeah. mm -hmm. to yes. go, oh yeah, that's colonial, yeah. that's very prescriptive and this. But then mm. when it comes to narrative, it's like, it's mm. again, it gets a free path. For me to receive some pushback, mm would you know that's one thing but be, like from where i've heard this from before are peers or colleagues who are often negatively racialized who are go actually nerve therapy is not all that mm. and i know you we've mm. had these conversations we've had these conversations and i've had to go oh really <laughs> <laughs> you mean I've been lied to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Within the therapy that says it does all the wonders. Anyways, ah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. so I think, you know, so for me to say something is one thing, but then the emotional labor that's uh, people have been, you know, again, this has been said. It's right. just not being listened to. Hmm. Um, just finally with this too, that kind of sparked why this is really important in terms of merging narrative therapy with critical and somatic is um, in the National Inquiry, one of the truth tellers who shared their story said, I feel like my spirit knows violence. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I'm just gonna leave that quote mm -hmm. right there because it just speaks to how it's more than just mm -hmm. the body. Well, when you were sharing all those really powerful pieces, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking a lot about your work in practice and how you worked with um, survivors, indigenous girls, women who were survivors of, of sexualized violence, and how often your body becomes a site of shame because of that kind of violence. And so the, the bringing the attention back to the body, I, I can see that being a site of resistance because of how painful it is, mm -hmm. but I wonder what, and I wonder what this made you think of when you were considering your work, Thank especially. You. Thank you so much. Oh um, and how the body and the that and the work that you need to attend to when you are healing from such, such often such physically violent forms of, of assault. When it comes to talking about the body and the effects of sexualized violence, in particular with my Indigenous younger uh, clients or people I work with, and, and I say that because cause my body work and the violence that's opposed on me is mm. extremely night and day different mm -hmm. and so for me to even make that assumption that they even want to talk about yeah. body yeah. like there's so yeah. m it's such a deeply rooted shame yeah. that yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very careful mm. with like mm. so it's that fine line like doing some trauma work and knowing that trauma sits mm. in the body mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but is that necessarily my work at that time yeah. to do with them yeah. I don't know Absolutely. I think the key, the part that really sticks with me is that is that um, is that there's folks that are trying to shift the narrative around how we do how we be in relationship with with communities and support them through 
these moments of, of healing, but we're f still caught up in a colonial structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I often think about um, Gayatri Spivak's work in this it, only because she's like super complicated and I can't understand 90% of what she's <laughs> saying. But, <laughs> but the parts that really do speak to me is that is how she contextualizes power. And even in the most um, disempowered communities, there's still folks who are still in power. Mm. And so, you know, nations that have been impacted by colonialism that are still functioning within a colonial mindset and, and system are going to find themselves often confronted with who is in a position of power to say that, you know, this can happen this way. Yeah. And so when you say, you know, somebody needs to step up, I completely agree. And, and I also think that there, you know, it's, it's that circular uh, motion that somebody needs to step up and then others need to support yeah. and continue, you know, learning and, and mirroring that work. Um, I can't help but think about Sisters Rising work in this because I think what you've done, Sandrina, with that is that you've, you've been able to change the narrative of how research is done mm -hmm. and to center communities, knowledge as, as so much, it is so important and valued um, at the same place as, you know, a academic, for example. And I think that that is a way of changing the narrative. So, you know, you're s that's Sisters Rising and Kinship Rising is stepping up. They're, you know, trying. I think, too, in doing that work differently, like around equity and justice in, you know, material justice, like yeah. that mm. participant's experience of trying to have elders paid at least on the same level as a yeah. clinical supervisor and in fact it should be more mm -hmm. you know i like in the work that we do it is a daily fight yeah. mm -hmm. you know i can get for a research session or a counseling training session or a student session um, a corporate catering company paid a huge amount <laughs> Uh, or a cons uh, you know a consultant with university credentials paid without the blink of an eye pass through my funding, but I can't get you know an elder who handwrites an invoice. Mm. I can't get a knowledge keeper mm. who's gathered medicines in cedar. You know those receipts come back like you can't claim cedar, and so mm. you know I found that's where a lot of the advocacy and the pushback yeah. happens like you've all said like these institutions are remain colonial our grants granting system our funding formulas remain colonial with what is valued and you know who's an expert and I just raise my hand for people who fight that fight because mm -hmm. it is grinding yeah. <laughs> and it has often felt extremely dispiriting yeah. and it's often been like those small things like when it's your fifth receipt f handwritten by an elder in a small community who gave their heart and their mm -hmm. soul to come and work with your group mm -hmm. and they their payment is delayed by weeks because someone in admin deems that expense. Um, you know cannot be processed yeah like those are the moments where <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. you know and so yeah i really appreciate that you name that mm -hmm. um and that you bring that forward mm -hmm. yeah i could like rant on yeah. and on about that one. <laughs> no, oh no, my god I, <laughs> I appreciate it um let's just do any final questions or okay. reflections mm -hmm. i think that'll be do you have anything you go first yeah no okay go um ahead. Well, I think, you know, um, we could throw out the baby with the bathwater, as they say, and just say, you know, most therapeutic mm. modalities have their roots in colonial thinking around, you know, the separation between the mind and the spirit or the appropriation of oral or somatic traditions around the world that have always existed. And, but. I appreciate your point and your struggle with narrative therapy and the desire to kind of stick with it because, you know, we've talked about this, I think, um, Indigenous people and 
people who have these different histories as part of their ancestral traditions can return to them and reclaim them mm. and recenter them as part of a decolonial practice. And that's something that's available to us. And the complexities of that are for another video. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, as you've said, if you're trying to be a critical kind of anti-colonial white practitioner, you can't appropriate those. And they have existed, like soma blending somatic with political is not new. Mm. It's been done across the world mm -hmm. uh, prior to colonialism, but also as an essential resistance to colonialism. And so I appreciate your struggle with narrative therapy as uh, like an option, a valid, important option yeah. for white practitioners. Like it comes from white practitioners. <laughs> Um, and to like kind of stick with what it could be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I appreciate this attention to like why would that be so threatening if we just removed it from its pedestal but didn't throw it away mm -hmm. and just stuck with like how to expand it and mm -hmm. make it more critical and responsive mm -hmm. to the fact that we live in an active colonial state and we are all accountable to undoing that in our work with healing and therapy and just in our daily life and mm -hmm. so i don't know I, i just find your sticking with it mm. <laughs> really important and, yeah. and valuable because i think it's easy to say you know let's throw this out but what other options would a white practitioner have and yeah. so s seeking to make it more vital more generative and removing some of the defensiveness or the pedestaling or the fragility is mm -hmm. just incredibly valuable. Like we mm -hmm. need all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need a range of options for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if we start to like limit because things are imperfect, we won't end up with much. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but I think like that's the real beauty and value of your work. And I just yeah. raise my hands to you for engaging in that and sticking with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it, and narrative therapy is still very important to me. I'm, mm -hmm. I would far from call myself a purist, I'm, which is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Just oh right yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's interesting. Um, I haven't mentioned him in, in the video, but there's a narrative. He calls himself a narrative therapist, and he's a psychologist. And he's... Um, He's biracial and he grew up in a transracial home in the U.S. And he talks about, um, he's brilliant when it comes to deconstructing out of therapy. Like he's, he's someone that I need to connect with. <laughs> But what, what he talks about is, um, he, he's na he calls uh, them, them, people out there, the narrative therapy police. Mm that there's people who, if mm. you're not doing it exactly the way that Michael White and David mm. Epstein wrote about a long time ago, then you're not a narrative therapist. Or if mm. you haven't trained enough, you're not a narrative therapist. And he, as a narrative therapist, he identifies as that. He even says, so then, okay, I'm not doing narrative therapy then. Mm. Like, I don't really care what, what it is that I, what it's mm. called, um, but it's the actual work yeah. that I need to really pay attention to. And so I, I just appreciate him a lot and just wanted to mention his work. Who is um, this? Travis Heath? Travis Heath. Mm. I've sent you yeah. lots yeah. of his stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I just, he's just uh, a breath of fresh air when it comes mm. to, there's, there's a lot of other, not a lot, there's a few other people who are questioning narrative and really expanding on it. Mm. And um, seeing that mm. gives me, gets me excited mm. that I could stick with the narrative, but mm. figure out how that works for me, how that works for the for people I work with mm -hmm. and my colleagues around mm. me and people that I, um, that are my co-conspirators or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that could be your like final comment. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I would love yeah, to no, write totally. about it. I think that's <laughs> I think that's a good place. Exactly. To end. I 